If the heavens ever did speak, he's the last true mouthpiece. Every Sunday's getting more bleak, a fresh poison each week. We were born sick, heard them say it. My church offers no absolutes. He tells me worship in the bedroom. The only heaven I'll be sent to is when I'm alone with you. I was born sick, but I love it. Come on, me to be well. Hey, hey, man. Hey, man. Hey, man. Take me to church. I'll worship like a dog at the shrine of your lies. I'll tell you my sins, and you can shop in your knife. Offer me the death instead. Could God let me give you my life? Take me to church. I'll worship like a dog at the shrine of your lies. I'll tell you my sins, and you can shop in your knife. Offer me the death instead. Could God let me give you my life? I have religious trauma disorder. It's an offshoot of post-traumatic stress disorder, which if you saw my last video, Survivor of Domestic Abuse, I have struggled with uh, post-traumatic stress and anxiety due to a lot of issues with domestic vi violence towards from my ex-husband, ex-boyfriends, and it goes on. So this is about my history with um, a conservative fundamentalist Christian based church, Christian church. Um, I'm not, I'm going to do my best not to say the name of the church or the denomination um, or anyone that I knew, merely because my intention with this is not to slander, is not to hurt the people that I went to church with, but merely to share my story so that if there's other people that are going through something like what I went through, or worse, <laughs> or better, whatever, um, it can help them a little bit. So I started basically going to this particular denomination in Oregon in about 2001, maybe, um, maybe a little before that. Uh, I think that 2001 was about the time I accepted Jesus into my heart. Um, and in those early days, it was... It was very much, I was attracted to it and led to it because it was very much about love and about um, community and that unconditional love, which in so many other areas of my life up to that point, I hadn't been able to find. I had no love for myself. I didn't love myself. Um, and so I couldn't receive love from anywhere else. And we all are searching for love. Um, and that sense of unconditional love. And so I feel in those early, early days, 2001 to 2004, there was this sense of unconditional love. And as I continued forward in it, um, I look back and there were some things that stood out that were um, kind of taken, the scripture being taken out of context. Um, and being very manipulative and damaging to me as a woman, I had had relationships and had had sexual intercourse, and so there's that whole, um, this was during the purity movement, and also, you know, the true love weights, and the, um, the whole, you could be a born-again virgin kind of thing, and I kept falling, and getting to becoming a born-again, and a born-again, and a born-again, as it is, and, um, at the time, I didn't really understand fully what was happening or how it was affecting who I was and my, my psychological makeup or my um, belief of myself as a woman and as a human. But now I see that uh, how manipulative it was. You know, they, they really had no business telling me who I couldn't date. You know, they were very adamant about 
um, if they weren't a Christian or a believer, then you were unequally yoked and you shouldn't be with that person. And I, I look back on that and I feel like that really hurt me in exploring aspects of love, relationships that could have been positive, that could have been um, helpful to me. And I'm thankful that right now in my life I'm getting kind of a second chance to know somebody that the church at the time um, hindered because of their influence that uh, God wouldn't bless a relationship with somebody that wasn't Christian, wasn't a believer. And so I, you know, that was the first aspect. And of course I accepted it and, you know, I'd had issues before, relationships before, I had low self-esteem, I had anxiety. At this point it was undiagnosed. I didn't have the diagnosis of bipolar at this time. I had um, been given kind of a early false th diagnosis of um, ADHD and depression. So it was, I knew that there was something wrong with me. I had depression. I had all of these issues, but they weren't being really dealt with. It was like, here's your medication, go on your way. I, I could, you know, so I was looking for some answer to kind of fill that, that place and that was the void, but they quickly started twisting using their scripture to sort of like put me under their thumb. But, but, But in the end, even though there was that aspect going on, I think one of the reasons I allowed those early manipulations without question was because I have some really sweet memories and some people that I look back on with fondness, fond memories, and I will always love. I will consider them faithful forever friends, even if we are not um, as connected as we once were, um, merely because I don't necessarily follow or practice um, that kind of Christianity. Um, so I, shortly after about 2004, I graduated from college. I had spent about a year outside of just living on my own, not going to college, um, before I went on to grad school and um, kind of figuring what I want to do with my rest of my life. <laughs> and I was working and um, I would go to church and I'd also had some friends, secular, pagan, as they said, down at a coffee shop. And it was kind of torn between those two worlds. And I Looking back, I think that um, both of them were precious to me and equally important in me finding my own version of who I really am um, and defining that for myself, choosing what I want for myself and spiritually as well, like what I believe and, and helping me to see the good in people um, and the bad and, and, and also in myself. And I think also in a, in a very... Um, amazing way these little pagans at the coffee shop helped me find strength to choose my own path and um, as the years went by even though they wouldn't be in my life their influence in my life um, helped me to make the decision to leave so in about 2004 I moved back to my home county in California to go to grad school um, to get my teaching credential and I didn't really want to do the teaching thing I just didn't know I was an acting at the time I'd kind of given up on that aspect of my dream so I was kind of floating around not sure what to do and of course I started attending um, the same denomination down in um, that county my hometown and once again, at first it was really good, but I remember there was a next layer of 
things that, that started to be a little bit of red flags. For example, they pastor would say from the pulpit, um, we're going to have interfaith, uh, interfaith meetings. And in Oregon, when the pastor or anyone that was in leadership would say that, we would actually go and break bread with other denominations. And it was like very open and connectivity. Well, the first thing I noticed is the interfaith meetings, meetups, were the same denomination. And it just kind of spiraled down from there as I continued forward through those years. That some didn't seem right. That's not interfaith. That's interdenominational. Um, and it went deeper than that in that this denomination that I was a part of started to talk about how they had the correct interpretation of scripture and they had the correct way of how to teach the Bible and how to have a, like how to even do um, Sunday church or Bible studies or anything. They had the correct way. They had the correct interpretation. And however, their church was either empty or just wrong in their interpretation. And... Um, so there's that. And then the next level was they would go to other fellowships, other denominations. We'd have, like, we would sometimes go and, like, break bread or just hang out or go to events. And it was always, like, smile, like, yay, you know. And it was almost like we were going to show these other denominations how to be Christian the right way by being in their presence. We're going to love on them. These were the same people that believed in Jesus the same way we do. They just had a different way of praying or reading the Bible. And then we'd go back to, they'd go back to their church, and it would be the same kind of couched in spirituality. Look what they're doing wrong, and look how good we are. Um, the next thing was, early in those days, like 04, 05, I remember them talking about how the governor of California just passed a law that if a pastor speaks out against homosexuality that he's gonna go to jail it was like this like there was over and over and over and over and over and over again there was always this use of like fear tactic of the news that wasn't like I never saw anything in the news or anywhere that backed that up but they would use this again and again and so I always expected that at any point, like, the cops are going to come in and just, like, drag the master off. <laughs> and that never happened. And so I think it was just this one way of showing us that everybody's against us. And it's us against them. And it's, you know, and the world out there is just full of debauchery and sin and anything goes. And it's not necessarily the case. So it became very, more, very, very um, exclusive and closed. And, yeah. And um, as the years went by, well, I was at that one denomination. And I started teaching after I graduated. And I started having mental breakdowns. And I started lashing out in anger um, because that's what kind of brought on the final diagnosis of bipolar and I had to go into recovery, and I lost my job, blah, blah, blah. So I eventually sort of had so much anger attacks that, um, and, like, um, outbursts that I um, that I, I was asked to leave, but I, I was away from that, um, that particular church. And it's not um, a good experience. I'm not proud of that time of my life, but um, it is a part of my life, and it shaped who I am today. Honestly, I think that a lot of that came about because I was never, I wasn't able to express my true self or my true feelings. I felt very restricted. I didn't know where I was going. I felt trapped, and like I never really learned in my childhood and my family and my growing up years how to express myself express my feelings I know I always felt like I was different and um, on the outside looking in as it were and 
um, I'm okay with that now. And I surround myself with people that are okay with that and love me for me. And if they don't, I just... I also have to say this. I don't have proof of what I'm going to say next because it happened just between me and him and no one was around. But due to my my breakdown and my diagnosis, um, one August 2007, I was having, it was the biggest, the worst breakdown I've ever. My boyfriend of one year had just broken up with me. My, um, maybe it was two years at this point, I don't know. And then my, um, and my grandfather, my favorite grandfather uh, died and it was the first ever grandparent to die. And I was heartbroken. Now I just have to say that the Christian boyfriends that I've had are some of the most manipulative and controlling. My ex-husband wasn't Christian, but looking back on relationships I had before I was married, the ones that fit were similar to my relationship with my ex-husband were the ones that were Christian, both of them. I'm not going to go too much into that, but just to say that they were just as emotionally manipulative, um, da degrading towards women. I had a boyfriend at the time, the one that had broken up with me, but this was when we were together. We were sitting in a parking lot talking in my car. The door was open. Some girl walked by with heels, and he, this guy goes, she only does that so guys will look at her. And then he looked at the bottom of my shoe for some reason, and he was like, oh, there's a quirky thing. You just wear it. The girls wear that so they could get attention from guys. So that's the other thing I was going to say is it was the heart of the purity movement and being virginal and being pure and dressing to not tempt. That was one thing they kept telling us, that if we wore certain articles of clothing, we, we as women were tempting men. It was our responsibility to dress and act in a way that would not tempt men and to me i mean that for me that caused i'm a very large breasted woman always have been um the barbie doll body i started having anxiety that if i wore anything i would be looked at as if i was flirting with them or if i was tempting them i'm also a very affectionate person I always have been very huggy i want to hug everyone big deep hugs if i did that the men would think that i was sort of like giving them like like trying to and it was like I started like questioning my own like motives and I started as like the years went on I started having more and more issues body issues body dysphoria I hated my body I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin so one of the things that was huge and that stands out to me is August 2007 grandfather had just died boyfriend of two years had just broke up with me I go to talk to the pastor who had been counseling me all, all along and I look to him as a father and I go in and I'm crying like I couldn't even speak I'd never been able to express my emotions and all I could think of was just cry just just cry and he says your tears are like crocodile tears now I know at that point that I had used a lot of manipulative tactics that people that have a mental illness of any sort when they're in pain they can do things that can be manipulative to get comfort, to get people to take care of them, because I was like a child in many ways. But um, at this point, I, I couldn't say to him, no, these are real tears, because I was so overwhelmed. So I couldn't say that. So I did eventually kind of, we prayed, I calmed down, I was walking out the door, and I made some kind of joke. And he said to me, lots of women that I have counseled have fallen for me, or had feelings for me. And I remember thinking, like, I, I, I was confusing. It was a weird thing to say because I had always thought of him as a father. I mean, he was not attractive in that way. Uh, so where did that come from? And then a couple of weeks later was when I was asked to leave because I did something that, that was abusive towards his family. No one knows what he said to me to cause me to do that in the fragile place I was in. Um, and so as years went by, I would um, start to get healthy 
and take it really seriously where I would go to, you know, I was going to 12 step groups. I was going to private therapy. I was going to self like group therapy. Um, I was taking medicine. I was seeing a psychiatrist. I was writing, I was journaling. I was going to church. I was doing like my job was to get healthy. I didn't work that much. I worked for a while and then I quit and I was like, I am just going to get healthy. It's my job. And I didn't work until about 2010 um, when I went back to school and I was working for about two weeks at a, um, at a, at the college, uh, bookstore. So, um, so yeah, I just focused on my health and my healing and what I needed to do. And every once in a while I could run in, I, by this time I was going to another of that same denomination. I went to two, I went to three down on that, down in California. Um, and I would see this pastor around and it would be like, if it was just me and him, like I'd be seeing him in a coffee shop and he'd be like, come over and we'd sit and talk and talk for like an hour a little bit, or it'd be nice and friendly. And then if he saw me with other people, it was like, I can't be your friend right now, or you're calling me too much, or you're, you know, and then like the next time I would see him, I'd be like, hi. And then it was just this weird, like back and forth. And I always felt like it was my fault. So I went on and I was getting healthier and I was also, you know, starting to study psychology and look at things in a different way. It was a little bit, you know, I've always been a reader. And, uh, so I, I, um, I've always been a reader. And so I started to, you know, see things a little bit differently, have a little bit more of an open mind, have goals beyond just being a Christian. Like I, I was thinking that I was going to go back to school and I was going to get my mental health license and be a therapist and help people that had been in my situation. And I was kind of going with that. Well, um, one of the pastors of one of the churches I went to instructed me, didn't know that I was taking medication or seeing a therapist said that therapists are, you know, their psychology is like the tools of the devil. Psychiatrists, they prescribe my mood altering drugs. Like it was just like, whoa, this isn't true. And I eventually found my way to forgive him for that because I felt like God told me to forgive him and, and you know, forgive that ignorance. But still, that was a common theme. Um, I, the last of that denomination that I attended, um, a lot of times the, the, this denomination, the pastor and the people would say, you know, the church is the hospital, but, and the sick come to it. But I didn't really feel like the sick were getting healthy because I didn't see that people could be really, truly honest with what they believed. So, um, if they couldn't be honest <clears throat> with what they're going through, like me with having a mental illness, it was seen as, if I brought it up, it was seen as like, you know, spiritually dark or satanic. And so people weren't dealing with their darkness of emotions. They were just like, it's scary. I'm not going to look at it. It was like, it's not healthy. Um, put on that you know, happy face and go to church and talk about how great the Lord is. And that was it. And I also found increasingly that they would tell us basically not to read any other books, but the Bible. And if not, if you want to read other books, then they had, um, like a library that you could choose from that they had read and said, this is appropriate. So it would be books by authors of that denomination or like pastors they went to that denomination that had written these books and studied the Bible and said, this is like the right book to read. Um, but nothing else. Oh no, that's not a good book. It's Christian, but it's not right. It's not biblically correct. Or, you know, it was like all in their own worldview. It wasn't anything compared to anyone else. Um, and so there was that, there was an aspect of like not to educate yourself, um, to watch or surround yourself only with, Christian news or Christian music only or anything that like validated your worldview. And the reason was you have to immerse yourself spiritually to keep yourself pure and keep yourself clean. Um, so when I started to kind of move away slowly, I think a lot of times what got me 
so there was a little coffee shop at this particular church and um, to save money they said everybody bring your own mug so I brought my mug and I remember one day when I had attended my last day but I did not know like consciously I think deep down inside I was like this is it I think I've been sort of like stepping back more and more and like at times I just wouldn't go I just didn't feel comfortable and I'd stay home or it was like a drive to get there and I just wanted to be by myself and I just was stepping back um and this was about 2010 and um and just wanting to be more centered closer to home or whatever so I was sitting there you know walking around after church and noticed that everybody was talking at each other but not really with each other there was no real connection I noticed I couldn't really connect with anyone and never really had if I tried to it didn't seem like a real relationship even though I do care for these people and have fond memories and I remember walking over to the coffee shop and picking up my coffee mug and just kind of saying aloud to myself like I'm just gonna take this home for a while I want to take this home nobody heard me and I walked to the back door and I kind of looked back and nobody said bye or even noticed and I let the door close behind me and now there's this little back alleyway and I walked out down that back alleyway and there was a gate that kind of like was in the middle of, or in the heart of a city so they had to kind of keep things like that I pushed open the door and stepped out and let it close behind me and that was the last time I ever went back to that particular denomination oh really and, and I didn't know though and uh, it was the hardest it was really hard in those early years I mean I, I got back into relationship with my ex-husband and that whole mess happened and dealing with that they got it to I couldn't focus on the damage from the church the the religious trauma until I got rid of him and then I could start to look at how I had allowed so many aspects of emotional abuse including the abuse from the church um, Jesus I don't think would be very pleased with what he sees in the modern-day Christian fundamentalist conservative church um, I remember trying at one point when I had moved back to Oregon and I was married I was listening to a Bible study and I remember they're doing a, a, a Bible study and I remember it had this um, the pastor said something like three times and it had nothing to do with my circumstance but by the third time I started to feel convicted and I turned it off and I realized that's circular reasoning that is an aspect of manipulation of, of control now at this point I was able to see that because I hadn't listened to that Bible study I hadn't been immersed in the church world for a while so I was able to listen to it be a little bit more step back and I was angry I was very angry um, just in general I uh, angry and confused and lonely because I had lost like I'd been there for seven eight years involved to this world and because also my husband was non-christian I was suddenly like I think they thought that by kind of cutting me off and like putting a barrier you're not doing you're not walking right with the Lord so instead of we're gonna love you by shunning you I guess <laughs> and so I felt very lonely and confused in that way and I also would try I don't know why because this is just who I am in general I want to save like this is a cult this isn't right it isn't right of course people don't they have to see it for themselves so it was just very tumultuous and I felt very lonely and I felt like I couldn't find anyone who else like in those early early years when I was first married and all the stuff I was going through I couldn't find anyone um, it's like 2011 2012 I couldn't find anyone that was experiencing or had experienced what I was going through what I had gone through what I had just left what I had escaped I guess um, But, you know, and I was also trying to figure out what I believed about Jesus. I remember another tactic that they used that the pastor would say from the pulpit, don't worship me, worship Jesus, don't worship me, don't worship me, don't worship me. I'm not God. 
And when you say don't enough times, the brain starts to just hear worship me. It's like a tactic. So there was lots of little tactics like that that were passed down. They would take pastors that were young, like they would take them fresh out of high school, told them not to go to college. And oh yeah, women couldn't teach over men. They could teach other women or children, but women were, you know, it was um, God, man, husband, wife, children. Man was like the spiritual head of the family, like represented God. And um, so women were just another level of devaluation and disrespect. Um, I would not be surprised if a lot of the women that I attended church with that are married are in some form of emotionally abusive or even worse relationships and are just told that they need to submit to their husbands and feel like they can't get out. Um, education in general was looked down upon. I, you know, when I had gone to grad school and it was not something, it was like, oh, that's really cool. That's not, you know, that's not the biblical way. Yeah, so a lot of the pastors were people that had come out of high school and been sort of chosen by God, been selected by the pastors, by the older leadership, and trained up. And so they had never had any other education, or if they'd had maybe a little bit, like high school, and then maybe like a couple semesters of college, and that's it. And they never educated themselves beyond, like they just went into, there's no like seminary, there's a Bible college, but there's no seminary, there's no actual training, there's no degree that you get. And so, you know, it's a very um, insulated worldview without any kind of truly really very close-minded and I don't mean that in a slanderous way to these people because once again I have a lot of fond memories and I care about them um, but there's no they don't see any they cannot see anything from another point of view because they've been sort of controlled and trapped in this one view and made to feel shame for things that they should be proud of like the people women that did maybe or men that did go to continue forward with school they okay now I'll just be a mom like we should be proud that you have that but they can't see that I think they feel shame because they did it they didn't just get called early on in life and become a Christian no they have this past even though Jesus has wiped it clean they still feel some shame um so I think there's a lot of shame and I think if you see a Christian on the street or fundamentalist or you have one in your life, they may seem very happy and but they're not there's not a lot of honesty within themselves because either they don't really know themselves, they can't know themselves, they have to put on that mask, they have to do you know, follow the line that's like been shown them to walk that is the righteous path. You know, it's not their righteous path. It's the path of righteousness that has been dictated then by the church leadership. Um, I found healing with the Bible. A lot of people that have left a, a church like that um, throw out the Bible. Like, eh. But I have fond memories reading the Bible and I have things that I got from the Bible that were meaningful. And even the Bible studies, all of that was like always very, you know, because I'm a reader. So reading a book, I, I find I find so much wealth from just reading whatever that is. And I grow as a person. And so I couldn't throw out that. But one thing that saved it for me is I was realizing that every of these denominations, all these churches had their own literal translation or interpretation of the Bible. And yet they were all different. And I was like, well, if everyone has their own little literal translation, then there is no literal translation. There can be no literal translation. No one can be right because you can't prove that you're right. You, it's just in your own point of view. And it's a figurative spiritual text. And in that, it can have a lot of value um, on its own. I also, at the same time of that same year, was reading the Hindu spiritual text, the Sarma Bhagavatam, I hope I say that right. I found a lot of the 
the rhetoric in the in that book the hindu text as in the bible the way they were worded things like in the hindu they would talk about you know sit at the lotus feet of the lord and it sounds like exactly like sit at the feet of the lord you know worship at the feet of the lord it's very similar and a lot of the same kind of way this just seemed very um um similar to me so i'm able to hear the Bible or remember or see people that maybe are at a coffee shop reading the Bible or walk by a church and not have such much panic attacks like oh, I gotta get out of here I just kind of go mm -hmm. that was a good time you know and send out like positive love but it took a lot for me to get there it was about 2016 so it took I left in 2010 and I was in about seven years or so maybe eight and it took about six years for me to finally get to that place and it took a lot of me finally I found a podcast called the drunk ex pastors which was by two former pastors ex pastors now of that particular denomination and then through that met a lot of people that were listening that were like me um, that we connected with and then at the same time I also found a lot of um, other people in my life that have gone to similar type churches and had similar type experiences and so we started talking and sharing and laughing and just like looking at the absurdity and it, it helped me to realize that I'm not crazy and I'm not alone and and also to have compassion for those people and and forgiveness um, you know sort of like um, forgive them for they know not what they do and realizing that the God that I thought I saw in the church was really just one tiny aspect and that God or the divine is so much more real and present out here than in there and yeah. um, I've tried to express that to these people because some of them are on um, still follow me or like me on Facebook or whatever friend me um, and a lot of them as soon as I got divorced from my abusive ex-husband as soon as I got divorced and separated from an abusive person without even questioning why I got divorced they suddenly unfriended me because a woman does not divorce a man so they didn't even ask like why did you divorce them it was like well you you know if they would have they would have heard me say well I was um some of them follow me on Facebook but because I'm pretty open in my private or personal life about the dot denomination they know so they either like don't follow me and so there's not a lot of communication um, between us but I've learned I can't do anything so I try more and more to just follow my own path and to kind of come to my own understanding and give out love to them as I give out to anyone else I don't see them as an enemy I pray for them in my own way now that they can find the freedom and the healing that I found um, so that's all I think I need to say for now and I if you have any questions maybe subscribe below I will put these three videos um, that I've done in one little um, album I guess and uh, subscribe to my channel um, share it if you want to ask questions if you need to thanks God above, but all I've ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody who outdrew you. It's not a cry that you hear at night, it's not someone who's seen the light, it's a cold and broken heart.